In the rapidly evolving gaming space, there have been countless of entries that garner a massive following upon launch or later down the line, only to be left abandoned soon after. Today, I want to share with you all the brief history behind some of these forgotten video games while also taking a stroll through them to get a sense of the current state they all reside in, whether that be with a player base filled with dedicated fans, no players in general, bots, or literally outright criminals. This is exploring games that you've forgotten about. I didn't stream these games, but I do stream every now and then so feel free to drop by if you like this video. We're going to start off with two games simultaneously as they both pretty much share the same villain, Wizard 101 and Pirate 101. After using funds generated from the sale of Inet Technologies in 2004, Ellie Achillian founded the company King Zio Entertainment in 2005, though they didn't make themselves known until 2008 with the release of Wizard 101, a massive MMO set in a fictional world known as The Spiral. The development cycle for this game was pretty clean. With their game now in the market, it was time for some promotion. I'm only bringing this up because they plastered ads everywhere. Yes, I do mean everywhere. By 2010, the game received upwards of 10 million registered players, with that number only increasing with the years that followed, which is why it was no surprise that King's Isle announced that they would be releasing another game set within the same universe known as Pirate 101. Things seemed to have been going pretty well for both games. However, that all seemed to change in 2014 when Rat Beard became the lead designer at King's Isle. Ratbeard was basically Voldemort to the community. I have no doubt his name is treated as taboo in the spiral. The growing sentiment seems to be that the game has progressively gotten worse ever since he took control. Although he has quite a track list, I'm going to focus on the two subjects I feel are most important, the changes in combat and his attitude towards the community. Many in the community believe that Ratbeard has a strong dislike for the PvE side of Wizard 101. In case you don't know, PvE just means players versus enemies enemies, basically just fighting NPCs or mobs. Ratbeard must have assumed the PvE was too easy and therefore decided to make it harder. But instead of improving the AI or just increasing the health, he decided it'd be best if the players did less damage overall while the enemies had a higher chance of hitting criticals. This just made any and all fights feel utterly slow, let alone too difficult, which in turn made the game quite boring. Then when it came to PvP, he decided to completely rework the system that was perfectly fine well this is something this is awesome Ratbeard. i know you were in stream i don't know if you're still here it would be really cool if you could just end this match there's two fewer jays and cure actually no if you just keep them here we don't have to fight them they also decided to change the matchmaking making sure to match you against players at the same division or at least around the same skill level there's a lot both good and bad that you can say about skill based matchmaking but it's honestly not a good system to implement when the player base had already began decreasing this caused certain players to wait eons in queue just to give up as it wasn't even worth it anymore pvp was a really big part of the wizard 101 world so when the state of it inevitably got worse and worse most players decided to just quit i want to say this video is for ratbeard bro ratbeard is the goat all right he is the goat of Wizard 101. Now, in my opinion, Ratbeard cannot take any criticism whatsoever. I literally watched his stream the same day I wrote this video, and someone in chat pointed out that PvP is still in a terrible state. His response was literally just, that's not true, you were probably just molding. Right now, PvP is in the worst stage ever. Ever? I find that very hard to believe. I am going to guess, if I were to go back and watch Sauce's vid from last night, if he was raging. Sometimes when he has a bad night, my chat will, will uh, fill up with people saying that PvP is in the worst stage ever. I understand it can be really annoying when people shove the same criticism down your throat, but to completely ignore it is not going to make it go away. People are saying it for a reason, and it's usually because there is a problem that needs to be fixed. It's not like Helldivers where the developers came out later to say it was a joke my fault gang. He genuinely does believe what he says. Many in the community hate him for a reason. It doesn't feel like they're speaking to the lead developer of a game they love. It feels like they're speaking to their abusive boss. Notice how I completely forgot about Pirate 101? Well, it seems that the developers did as well. This one forum post practically summarizes the entire game's history. A moderator apologizes for not doing much but urges players to stay tuned as content is coming very soon. However, not a single reply in this forum is that of joy. Almost everybody has lost any trust they had after the first couple of more content coming soon posts were all duds. It goes without saying that if the developers don't care then why should the players? By the time any of these 
problems were even remotely fixed, a large majority of the community had already quit for good. So what do these games look like now? To start off with Wizard 101, I created my new persona and was immediately plunged into the tutorial. This one is just an opinion, but I hate how you can't walk right or left, instead your character just spins. Once inside the tower, we're thrown into our first instance of PvE. Ratbeard probably fought demons trying not to remove this from the tutorial. Jokes aside, the fight was pretty easy. I mean shit, not even the most delusional developer would make the tutorial unbeatable. Anyways, after that, you're sent down the main quest storyline. Here you'll be able to learn more about the world, the combat, and save the spiral. Thankfully, none of the PvE I encountered was difficult until I got to these screamers. Not only did we need four wizards, we also needed the fucking chosen one in order to make it out alive. There are also still a small amount of players it seems, but they're always huddled around this area causing your game to drop frames from all the chat spam. I didn't try PvP because 1. I didn't know it was a thing and 2. It actually does cost money if you don't have a membership, which I actually want to mention. I'm a main story type of gamer. My focus is just on beating the main quest. Although Wizard 101 is free to play, you're only able to get to a certain point before you're locked out of progressing further down the world. In order to complete these remaining two quests, you need to enter certain portions of the world that are locked off by a membership, ranging from as low as $10 a month to $75 a year. However, it is technically possible to complete the main storyline for free. Instead of unlocking the restricted areas with a membership, you can choose to purchase the area for 750 crowns. By the time I got to this point, I had about 150 crowns, and you can earn 100 crowns each day by taking some quizzes on the website. Meaning that had I maxed out these quizzes for an entire week, I'd be able to unlock this one area. Just this area. <laughs> Unfortunately, the prices only increase as we continue further. If my calculations are correct, 230,695 crowns are required to unlock every single area and dungeon within the game. When it comes to Pirate 101, it costs an additional 94,710 crowns to unlock every chapter of the game. If we add that number to our estimate, what we get is the following. As long as you max out the quizzes every single day, you'll be able to unlock the entirety of Wizard 1 101 and Pirate 101 within the next 8 years and 11 months, all to save $10. Hey, speaking of Pirate 1, why don't we take a look at that? Unlike Wizard 101, we're immediately in the middle of an entire war, though we're locked up so we don't get to see much of what's going on. A nitpick I have is that although Wizard 101 only includes the name Steven, not even Steve, Pirate 101 doesn't include either. Did they lose the rights or something? Why would they remove a name? Anyways, we speak to Bookbeard and are given a small quiz to determine what type of pirate we are. I'm pretty sure that depending on your result, your first encounter is different, but I'm not 100% certain. The combat this time around is, although different in style to Wizard 101, still overall the same. You're able to move spaces or attack the enemies if they're close enough on your turn. Although I strongly dislike this layout, the animations were pretty cool, so. We're even able to guide the ship every now and then, though only to get from one location to the other. From here on out, the game plays very similarly to Wizard 101. Start talking to Captain Avery, progress through the main quest, fight some enemies, recruit new members, and ultimately all F4 when the game doesn't allow you to progress further. I'm pretty sure there's a couple of more side quests you can do in both, though don't expect to be getting much without forking up some clams. I also want to mention that I randomly encountered this player, Clever Chloe Clegg, who just for some reason decided to give me some packs. Although I mostly got garbage from them, I still salute Chloe for the thoughtful gift. I honestly only explain the tip of the resentment this community has towards Rapbeard and King's Isle as a whole because we still have more games to cover in this video. If you want me to make a full in-depth video on the entire history of Wizard and Pirate 101, make sure to donate to my gold fund me so I can afford the membership. I'm just kidding. I'm, I'm just joking. Just leave a comment or something. Anyways, let's move on to the next games on our list that again fall in the same boat. Club Penguin and Club Penguin Island. In the early 2000s, developer Lance Priya began work on a Flash game known as Snow Blasters which would then transform into Experimental Penguins before moving on to Penguin Chat 1, 2, 3, and 4 until it was finally given the name Club Penguin in October of 2005. The game was a pretty decent success, with about 12 million registered accounts and 700,000 paying members. This prompted Disney in 2007 to acquire them for a nice sum of $350 million. Although the game grew steadily over the years, it was no secret that it felt quite old compared to the overall gaming market. By 2015, the game began to decline in popularity, forcing Disney to lay off employees before 
before making a bold decision. They were to shut down the servers in March of 2017 to make way for the new and improved Club Penguin Island. I still remember mining away at the iceberg with like 50 other people or something trying to flip it upside down. Currently Club Penguin is still technically available but only as a private server. New Club Penguin. This is the only version that currently still exists as the rest were taken down by Disney when they still cared. I don't suggest playing New Club Penguin though as the only way to play it is by downloading the web page. Although nothing bad has happened to me yet, this could still be pretty risky. Either way, we can see here that I already made my original character, Harambe 2020. I made the name when I was like 14, okay, shut up. The game plays just like Club Penguin, with the added benefit of a free permanent membership. Surprisingly, there still seems to be a good amount of active players. Some are obviously just bots, but it's still nice to see nonetheless. I was also happy to see that moderation still exists after trying to be a little goofy with someone. Anyways, almost immediately after shutting down Club Penguin, Disney released Club Penguin Island for mobile with a PC release later down the line. This game was a far cry from the original. Instead of focusing on just being a social hangout, Penguin Island focused more on being an adventure game with the ability to play through many different chapters and episodes. Not a bad idea, but it kind of goes against what Club Penguin was all about in the first place. Just a game where you're able to meet and chat with other players. It's also sort of annoying how the game is now in third person, yet you're still only able to move with your mouse? Like what was the point? Anyways, besides those two factors, the game was still Club Penguin in the end. Run around, chat with other players, and come to the realization that you're playing a game made for children at the age of 19. Not only did most players not welcome the change, they instead made it clear how much they missed the original by creating private servers that were actually more popular than Club Penguin Island as a whole. Which is why it was no surprise that just one year after release, Club Penguin Island would share the exact same fate as Club Penguin. Currently, you're also able to download Club Penguin Island, however it is a barren wasteland with the main quest being the only playable options. It's pretty interesting to me how Disney had practically abandoned the Club Penguin name by this point, yet they still weren't going to give it up. In April of 2022, London police raided the servers of Club Penguin rewritten, pretty much the most popular server at the time, due to a copyright violation reported by Disney. It's pretty fucked up considering that they weren't offering the game anymore but didn't want others to offer it as well. It seems that their main argument was that Rewritten was trying to profit off their IP with the use of ads, which I guess is somewhat true. Though again, money is also needed to run these servers. Thankfully, it seems like New Club Penguin is still here to stay, unless Disney watches this video and strikes them with the hammer of the law. Just a heads up, if you want to play the game, for the love of God, please search New Club Penguin and not their website name. Anyways, now we can move on to a game that may still be fresh within the deep crevices of your minds. Multiverses. On the 22nd of October 2021, a user on the r slash gaming leaks and rumors subreddit made a post detailing a new Warner Brothers crossover platform fighter developed by Netherrealm. It's even mentioned that the reason this game was created was due to the Ultra Instinct Shaggy memes. About a week later, Smash player Hungrybox posted a tweet showing off a supposed leaked image of the roster. This tweet was later taken down by Warner Brothers, cementing it as real to the community. About six months later in April 2022, five minutes of multiverses gameplay would leak from a tech demo. My god, this game cannot stop getting leaked. Three months later in July, the game's open beta would be released to the public. If you were living under a rock at the time, it was pretty popular almost instantly. However, soon after, the game began to drop from its over 100,000 average player count all the way down till it could just barely scratch even 1,000. There were a couple of reasons that led to this massive downtrend, but in my opinion, the most important two are the roster and lack of content. Fighting games like this need to put a good focus on character they're balancing more than anything. Nobody likes to play against a guy who wins by spamming a single button. Fuck you Reptar and Incineroar mains. However, it seems that the multiverse's roster consisted of characters that fell into this trap hard. Like look at Bugs Bunny dog. What the fuck is this? They did try countering this by adding an attack DK where spamming a single attack will cause it to do less damage. However, that didn't change the fact that these movesets were still really annoying. Then there was a lack of content. Not only was the battle pass awards practically worthless, they spent a total of four months before deciding to include a ranked mode. Now, four months may not seem like a long time to you, but you have to understand that in that time, the competitive players had nothing to do other than just wipe filthy casuals who also had nothing to grind for and instead played the game to kill time. I was in that same boat. I'm someone who only plays ranked game modes because casual just feels boring, but by the time they decided to add ranked, I had already forgotten all about the game. They did at least add new characters 
characters every now and then which was a good start but to me it seemed like too little too late people had already gotten bored and moved on a lot of people also reported laggy servers which i myself didn't experience back when i played it but i wouldn't put it past the servers either we can see just how quickly the player count began to drop as of now the game is only playable offline if you had it downloaded previously they are currently preparing for a full game release on the 28th of may however i'm willing to wager five usher bucks that the game will follow the exact same pattern its beta did start off with a huge spike in players forget to balance the roster while also neglecting content which ultimately leads to the player count whittling down once more anyways let's move on to a game which is probably one of the most disgusting and predatory children games only rivaled by roblox grotopia i played this game back in third grade man it's honestly so disheartening to see the current state it's in in 2012 developer mike hommel created an early version of what would be known as grotopia based on designer seth robinson's mockups the game released a pretty decent success which prompted satan uh, i mean ubisoft to acquire the game in february of 2017 to this day the game still seems to be updated quite regularly meaning it surprisingly hasn't been completely abandoned however that doesn't mean it's all well and good i want to explain the two most important aspects of grotopia world locks and trading trading is well just trading world locks are locks that give you full control over any world you are currently in you see in order to create a new world you'll have to type an unused name into the search bar or else you'll just enter an already existing one however the world isn't yours until you place a world lock meaning that anybody can run around break shit build shit it's basically an anarchy server without one whoever sets down a world lock then owns the world until it is either destroyed by the same user or by someone with special permissions you can understand why these locks are very valuable which is why they're the primary go-to item when it comes to trading at one point in time the top grotopia worlds were just created in order to have fun occasionally markets would begin to appear which wasn't all too bad at first however now any map created for the sole purpose of enjoyment has been completely drowned out this game has literally become a glorified flea market with prices of cosmetics sometimes totaling almost 10,000 world lock which comes out to a value of about 400 real world dollars although world locks are the most common trading item there are still countless other items both less and much more valuable almost nobody even uses these for its actual purposes anymore it's all just a trade when i logged into the game i saw that there were supposedly 50,000 players online although this initially made me think that the game was still well and alive that thought was completely shattered when i ran into several bots upon entering any of the top worlds all of which were just promoting other trade worlds that's not even mentioning that there are literal casinos and some of these worlds promise giveaways if they reach the number one world spot whether the giveaways are real or not it's just a way to get more players in there to hopefully ring them dry there's also allegedly a large amount of players who come in here to groom children but i can't speak to the validity of that claim as of now the only enjoyment i was able to find within this game was when i decided to type in the name of my elementary school and found a completely abandoned world when worlds are left abandoned for this long the locks expire or at least this type of lock does allowing you to just basically take control sorry to whoever owned this world your stuff is now mine forever i'd also like to add that when i initially started back in the day my friend gave me some crazy ass items that were actually pretty rare i also at one time accidentally spent about one thousand dollars from my dad's credit card on this game so i was completely dripped out when i originally decided to quit the game i literally went around and found a random guy and just dropped him all of my shit completely for free i don't remember who it was that i gave it to but if you're somehow watching this video i hope you didn't go off to sell those items please lord <laughs> anyways i might research this game further once this video is uploaded to see just how deep this rabbit hole goes let me know if that's something you guys might be interested in seeing but for now grotopia is no longer a game it is literally just a predatory market the final game on our list is one i'm pretty sure many of you esteemed gamers are familiar with artifact upon seeing the great success that was the trading card market both virtually and physically valve decided to dip their toes into the scene plans for this game were massive with a million dollar tournament being organized just to kickstart the esports scene and Gabe Newell giving his own little TED talk on the game's roadmap. It really did seem like we had a new behemoth coming right around the corner. However, the complete opposite happened. The game was initially being hyped with the premise of being an entirely new IP, which is why when players found out it would just be a trading card game set in the Dota universe, their reactions weren't the greatest. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
people were still willing to give it a chance at launch. Though to them 60,000 players is a major flop, let's be honest. Regardless, nothing changed how absurdly difficult the game was to follow. Artifact is played on three different boards simultaneously. Each board has a tower with 40 base health and the remaining 80 once destroyed. There are four colored heroes within the game, red, blue, green, and black. Remember that because there's a funny story coming in a minute. In order to place ally cards, a hero of the same color must be placed on the board beforehand. If no hero was placed on the board, you might as well say your farewells to that tower. At the end of each round, you're given time to spend any coins earned by destroying other cards in order to acquire spells. You also get the chance to place a new hero card on any of your three boards while your mana points increase by one. In order to win, you'll either need to fully destroy one board tower or destroy the base 40 health of two board towers. I will admit, it is pretty simple to understand once you take the time to learn. But before I played this game, I literally had no idea what in the ever-loving fuck I was even watching. Even understanding the basic fundamentals took me about an hour, but that might have just been my slow ass. Regardless, people's interest in the game died down pretty quickly as there was just no incentive to compete. Remember that $1 million tournament I mentioned? Well, to Valve, the game died so quickly that they backpedaled on their promise and just never even held it, practically killing any interest in the esports scene of the game. Not to mention, Valve really likes creating markets within their games as evidenced by CS and TF2. However, those markets were purely cosmetic, while Artifact's market was made up of cards that had varying abilities and advantages. Most people saw that the only way to really make it anywhere was by purchasing said cards, on top of a $20 retail price tag. Imagine having to spend $20 on a card game just to be forced into buying more cards if you wanted any real chance at competing. Of course, you could still grind the game normally, but let's be honest here, as long as you allow players to skip progression, they will take the opportunity to do so. Speaking of cards, remember the hero cards I mentioned and how they had specific colors? Well, they for some reason decided to introduce a new black ally card titled Crack the Whip, with its description reading modify a black hero. I'm sure you can immediately predict the responses to this announcement. They did later change the name to Coordinated Assault, but I can't believe that card came out with a name like that and the developers saw no issues with it beforehand. Anyways, currently Artifact is now free under the name Artifact Classic. It is still the same game, but I'm assuming they tried rebranding it to make it seem like they were going to put more effort into it. However, the last update was about three years ago. Although Valve pretends like the game never existed, there are still a couple of players that actively try keeping the community alive. I was surprised by the fact that I was able to quickly find online matches despite its abundantly low player count. I mean, these could very well be bots, but I don't think Valve would be naming them Spongebob of all things. Either way, this was just barely a tiny snippet of the problems this game faced. There are many in-depth videos on the entire history, so I urge you to check those out if you're interested. Sorry this video took longer than expected to come out. I ended up experiencing burnout and just needed a little bit of time to reach my peak performance once again. I'm all good now and I at least stockpiled a couple of ideas for the next few videos. Thank you to all my Pookie Club members. I love every single one of you for not letting me turn into a distant memory. Feel free to drop by anytime I do stream. There's no schedule. I kind of just go live whenever I feel like it. If you like this video, feel free to check out my other videos. Thank you all for watching and ciao ciao.